Our goal is to recreate Ultima Force opening sequence on the C128's VDC chip, something that hasn't ever been done before. On the left hand side we have the C64 version and on the right hand side we see the IBM PC's EGA version. Let's find out how the C128's VDC version compares to these. This is part 2. In the previous video we already went through all the animated text except for the actual title of the game, Ultima 4, which just appears without any bells and whistles. This video will be about unrolling the map and making these tiny cute little creatures appear on top of the screen. And we're not just doing this on the heavily underutilized VDC chip, we're also going to do this in Commodore BASIC and the VDC BASIC extension. While unrolling the map would be the next one, I feel like the animated creatures make for a much more interesting topic. So let's start with the creatures. How is this done in the original game? Just like in the last video, I'm heavily relying on the U4T compilation project and the Ultima Codex wiki, links in the description below. The file data.c shows two arrays for monster animation sequence. These are frame indices. The file animate.ega contains the frames for both creatures and they are numbered left to right, top to bottom. The fact that the frame indices have repeating numbers makes me think that the frame rate of the animation is fixed. Longer poses just have more of the same frames. First part was to get the frame indices into the program code. I used data statements. That was the easiest thing to do for a start. After that, I converted the bitmap file to the VDC chips format. This was mostly the same procedure I used for conversions in the previous videos already. Then I made sure the animation frames are stored in VRAM in a way that makes them easy and fast to read. When looking at animate.ega we see the first line of the first frame, after that the first line of the second frame and so on. That's good for looking at the frames for humans, but it's not the optimal way to store the frames in VRAM. We store them in a way that all the lines of a frame are stored together. Doesn't look great, but it's much faster to bring to the screen. And when we reduce the screen width to 12 bytes, which is the width of one frame, we see that everything is in order. Now we still have a challenge to master. VDC Basics VMC command can only copy continuous memory areas. Copying 32 lines would require calling VMC 32 times from BASIC and 32 loop iterations in BASIC are slow. So I had to extend the VMC command. So far we had source address, target address and the amount of bytes to copy as parameters. Now we also have number of repetitions and target memory address increment per repetition. So adding 32 and 80 as new parameters does exactly what we want. It calls block copy several times from within machine language. Each call skips the provided number of bytes on the target address. With a single command we can now copy a full animation frame from off-screen memory to on-screen memory in VRAM. Adding offset calculation to that, we can selectively copy a defined frame to the screen. The formula is quite simple. 32 lines with 12 bytes each means each frame occupies 384 bytes of screen RAM and due to the nature of how the color cells are configured, 192 more bytes for attribute RAM. Frame index times 384 or times 192 gives us the source address offset for a frame. Target address is 0 for the left creature and 79 minus 12 for the one on the opposite side. As we have a fixed number of frames, we can pre-calculate all these values. That leaves us with four arrays, one screen RAM and one attribute RAM array for each creature. And this is the loop that displays one frame after the other. SL and SR are screen RAM source locations for the left and right creature respectively. AL and AR are the same for attribute RAM. We get these values from the pre-calculated arrays. Then we call syn, which means the program waits until the screen is drawn. 
Then we copy screen RAM and attribute RAM of the left creature and the same for the right creature. Then we enter a loop that takes care of the correct speed of the animation. Let's see this in action. By the way, I didn't yet make sure that the EGA graphic files meet the VDC chip's color constraints so the creatures will look a bit weird. Now we can see both creatures on the screen animated. While I like the monster animation so far, the original opening sequence has them sliding in from the top while being already animated. Can we do this? Yes, and it's easier than you might think. We already had a sliding graphics before, so all we need to do is not to copy the full frame to the screen for the first 16 steps or so, just copy the last two lines, then the last four lines, then the last six lines and so on. Always copy them to the top left or top right. The formula took me a bit to be correct, but I finally made it. I created an array for pre-calculated values again, and the significant difference to the previous animation is that this offset is now taken into account. And here's the result, the creatures are sliding into the view. I know I say this in every video, but I just can't help myself being so excited that something like this can be done in Commodore BASIC with the help of a small BASIC extension. The VDC chip and especially its 64 kilobytes of VRAM make the C128 so much more capable than the C64. The offset calculation for the sliding in takes a little bit of processing time, even though we just do a lookup. Still, that's not needed once the slide in is done, so I decided for the easy way and just separated this in two loops. Once the final rendering position is reached, animations continue with fixed locations. With Creature Animation solved, let's go back to what we've been working on in the last video. The last step of the sequence was that Quest of the Avatar appeared. And next we will have to unroll the frame containing the map. To keep things simple, let's unroll the border first. And once that's done, we'll take care of the tiles inside. Unrolling the border is not too hard. We have all of it loaded from the title EGA file, ready to be used in the invisible part of VRAM. What we'll need to do is to copy this to the visible part of the screen, starting with the middle column first. Each column is actually two bytes wide, and then, step by step, we add one column on each side until we reach the border of the screen. The change we made to VDC BASIC about repeated execution of the VMC command should make this easy, right? But no! We only increment the target address by 80 bytes, the source address would just continue with the next pixel. But it would also need to skip 80 bytes to read from the next scan line. To also increase the source address, we'd have to call VMC over a hundred times from BASIC, 96 times for the pixels and 48 times for the colors. Or we would need to extend VDC BASIC again, to allow for increasing of the source address with each repetition. And that's what I did. Et voila, we have one more parameter, the more the merrier, right? And as you can see, increasing the source address by 80 bytes makes unrolling the border work perfectly. So in one single basic command, we order the VDC chip to copy a certain amount of bytes for a specified number of times by skipping a defined number of bytes. The new parameters are optional, so you can still use only 3 or 4 parameters if these are sufficient for your use case. Now on to the map files. These are stored in the file called shapes.ega and data.c contains the tile indices for the map shown. Looking at the map data, we see that the maximum tile index is hex f, which is 15 decimal. That means for the map tiles in the opening sequence, we only need to load the first row into VRAM. After loading shapes EGA and copying the first row of tiles into invisible VRAM, this is what we have there. You see that the top part, which contains the word present, is now overwritten by the first row of tiles. But that doesn't matter, as this is the invisible part and the word present is already rendered to the visible screen. At this point in time, only the tiles and the border are relevant to us. 
One row of tiles has 16 tiles, each 16 pixels wide, which equals 256 pixels in total. And that's 64 bytes, actually. One scan line is 80 bytes wide, so the second row of pixels in the tile set is actually still displayed in the first screen row, which is 80 bytes long. This is why it looks distorted in hidden VRAM when we look at it. But by setting register 1, we can reduce the screen width to 64 bytes, and now you can see that the data is correct. We can set the source address increment to 64 when copying tiles into the map frame. What is the algorithm to copy the right tiles to the right spot on screen? Basically, we want to calculate the starting point of each tile in memory. For this, we'll iterate over the data from data.c. It's just 95 numbers, I copied them over and manually corrected the hex values into decimal ones. Each copy operation requires source address and target address. For source address, we will use the index values from the data statements and multiply them by 4. By 4, because originally each tile takes up 2 bytes. But as our native resolution is 640 pixels instead of 320, we're duplicating them. So here one tile consists of 4 bytes instead of 2. 4 additions, by the way, are faster than one multiplication, but that wouldn't even matter here. Next, we calculate the target coordinate for screen RAM and for attribute RAM in T and T2, respectively. O1 and P1 are the offsets for screen and attribute RAM. XT is for the X target coordinate, the column. We set this to 2 because the bytes 0 and 1 are occupied by the blue border. So we will start with value 2 as the target coordinate. YT is the y-axis offset for the tile. In pixels, one tile is 16 scan lines high. For colors, one tile is 8 scan lines high. The offset for a line is multiplied by 80 because that's how long one scan line is. PS is the screen RAM starting address and AS the attribute RAM starting address. We're building up the map in the invisible part of VRAM, which is why both source and target address use PS and AS as offset values. Then we have two copy operations finally using all the values we just calculated. Source address, target address, length, one tile is 4 bytes, as mentioned one second ago, 16 copy operations for pixels and 8 for colors. We have 80 bytes target address increment per line and 64 bytes source address increment per line. And finally, increasing the target variable to make it point to the next map target tile. Once we reach the end of a tile line, make it point to the first one in the next line. The algorithm is complete. This copy operation is taking place in the invisible part of VRAM so that players shouldn't see how we place the tiles into the frame. But we are the programmers, so we can still watch it by setting start address of display and attribute RAM accordingly. And this is it. We are looking up the index of each tile and copy it from the top into the map frame. Let's watch it a second time, this time at 50% of the original speed. When tiles appear, you can see the color changing. This is because pixels and colors are set in different screen refreshes. We'll do a dedicated tweaking session and we'll try to take care of that then. The code for assembling the map tiles just goes before the code about unrolling the border we have seen earlier. With the tiles in place at the source address of the border, we can just get back to our unrolling algorithm. Copying now also includes the map tiles. This takes 140 chiffies to complete, which equals about 2.5 seconds. C64 and DOS versions take about 3 seconds, so I think this is just about the right speed. As a last step for this episode, let's merge the creature animations with the rest of the code. We are done with everything that we had in hidden VRAM so far, so we can just copy the creature animation frames to the first byte of the invisible memory area. Basically, I just merged the code about the animated creatures after the code for unrolling the map. In the next part of this series, we will deal with animating the water, moving characters on the map, and maybe even playing background music. 
Now let's watch what we have so far. If you enjoyed this and you don't want to miss the final part of this, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. See you next time here on the 8-Bit Theory.